Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, um, all right, Crimean War. I want to learn learn a little bit about you know major conflicts in Europe uh, between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the start of the World War. Um, and this is one of those major conflicts. Let's get right into it. Uh, armchair historian. It's been recommended a few times. If you're new to the channel, my name's Connor. Hello, I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. Join the Discord. It makes it easier for me to interact with you. Uh, the link will be at the top of the description, right under the link to the original video here. Go check them out. Like, subscribe, hit all the buttons. Get ready to learn. If you're not, you know the drill. All right, let's do it. Part two is available now. All right, this guy's American. I don't know what it is, just something about learning history with with a British accent narrator is just, I like it, uh, but obviously. As a fierce battle rages around them, the light brigade of the British cavalry is preparing to charge. Though their orders were vague at best, shouted over the din of gun and cannon fire, the of the British cavalry is preparing to charge. Though their orders were vague at best, shouted over the din of gun and cannon fire, the men are ready to ride forth. I like the animation. But unfortunately, for these brave soldiers, their charge will not be wholly remembered as a noble and triumphant action. Instead, it will go down in history as a monument to the chaos and foolishness of the Crimean War. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, Hello. the Armchair Historian. In today's video, we will be re-examining a topic which we He's call- got the pipe right there? Sorry. ADD. Historian. I gotta pay attention. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. In today's video, we will be re-examining a topic which we covered in one of the first ever videos on this channel, the Crimean War. One of the largest and bloodiest European conflicts in the 19th century, the war is remembered primarily for the disastrous incompetence of the commanders on both sides and the ultimate futility of the conflict. But while the immediate consequences were insignificant, the long-term effects of this conflict altered the course of European history and set in motion events that would one day lead to the First World War. Perfect. The Armchair Historian channel is made possible by our sponsors. Supporting them is the various the up or you can get past. Get all the money you can, man. All right. Ever since its foundation in the early 1700s, Imperial Russia had sought control over the warm water ports on the Black Sea, an area traditionally under the influence of the Ottoman Empire. Although once considered the menace of all Christian Europe, by the 19th century, the Ottomans were in a rapid decline a decline which Russia was eager to exploit. But after the tumultuous shakeup of the Napoleonic Wars, most other great powers of Europe desperately wanted to avoid any more disruptions to the balance of power, creating tension between them and the expansionist Russians. This tension finally boiled over in 1853, sparked by, of all things, a dispute over the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. In an effort to project power in the Middle East, France declared itself the protector of all Christians in the Holy Land and convinced the Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Majid I, to issue a decree that the Catholic Church had sole authority over all Right, I remember this uh, basic idea from the History Matters video. Obviously, this is going to go more in depth. But. In the Holy Land and convinced the Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Majid I, to issue a decree that the Catholic Church had sole authority over all churches, holy sites, and Christian citizens in Palestine. This irritated the Eastern Orthodox Church in Russia, which had previously held control over most of these churches. Of course, neither France nor Russia really cared about the religious rights of Christians in Palestine. Controlling churches meant projecting power and influence in the Middle East, a strategic goal of both nations. The French emperor had challenged Russia to a game of chicken, and the Ottoman Empire was unlucky enough to find itself right in the middle of it. 
not one to back down. The Russian Tsar Nicholas the First. It should seem obvious, but every conflict I learn about, there's always this unfortunate country in the middle that just gets stuck in between these two uh, fighting giants. Promptly sent an ambassador to the Ottomans in hope of changing these soldiers. Itself right in the middle of it. An ambassador to the Ottoman to back down. The Russian Tsar Nicholas the First promptly sent an ambassador to the Ottomans in hope of changing the Sultan's mind. This effort succeeded, and the Sultan promptly restored authority over the churches to the Orthodox Church in Russia. Expectedly, the highly ambitious French Emperor Napoleon III escalated the situation by sending a warship into the Black Sea as a show of force, which prompted Abdul. Majid to flip-flop once again and proclaim his eternal respect for the authority of the Catholic Church. Further negotiations proved fruitless, with the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire stepping in to support the Sultan against Russian retaliation. Neither side was willing to back down, and so in May of 1853... I love Ru this analogy he has going here. It's really helped that's honestly helped russian armies crossed the prut river and invaded the balkan provinces two russian armies crossed the prut river and invaded the balkan provinces of the ottoman empire Left with no other choice, the Ottomans declared war in response and sent forces to check the They have Russian good maps. Advance. This channel has good maps. Ooh, this could be a good one. The Ottomans declared war in response and sent forces to check the Russian advance at the Danube River. Arriving in September, the Ottoman Empire quickly moved to establish strongholds along the Danube under the leadership of the skilled general Omar Pasha. The first battle of the war took place in early November, when the Ottomans crossed the river and recaptured the occupied town of Oltenitsa in modern-day Romania. The Russians launched a... Okay. <clears throat> so, I, I know this is part one of two. It's almost better that I put it into two parts because it helps me learn that way. Uh, I can talk more about questions in the first part of the video and then move on to the next one, but... So, so far, it's about who's going to be the kind of representative of Christendom in the Middle East, and more importantly, control power in the Middle East. And uh, the Ottomans gave it to Russia. France said no, put a uh, ship into the Black Sea. Ottomans chickened out. They then supported France. And then Russia's like, no, no, and they start to invade. That's what I understand so far. High town of Oltenitsa in modern-day Romania. The Russians launched a counterattack to reclaim the town, resulting in a bloody and indecisive battle, which ended with both sides withdrawing to their previous positions. Fighting in the Balkans would continue in much the same way for the rest of 1853, with neither side managing to gain a decisive advantage. Tsar Nicholas was hoping for an announcement of support from Austria, his long-term ally, in order to break this stalemate. But the Austrians were reluctant to get involved. Instead, they hoped to settle things with the mighty pen and hosted a conference in Vienna with representatives from France, Britain, and Prussia with the goal of drafting a treaty to end the war. While these talks were ongoing, Russian warships chanced upon an Ottoman fleet near the port of Sina. Sorry, just got up. Okay. Hoping to disrupt their enemy's supply lines, the Russian ships opened fire initiating battle. This engagement saw the first ever use of explosive shells in naval combat, which completely devastated the wooden hulls of the Ottoman ships, inflicting over 3,000 casualties and destroying their entire... So up to this point on ships, it would just be a, a solid projectile? Entire fleet. The events at Sinop alarmed the other great powers and the representative ship in naval combat, which completely the Russian ships opened fire initiating battle. This engagement saw the first ever use of explosive shells in naval combat, which completely devastated the wooden hulls of the Ottoman ships, inflicting over 3,000 casualties and destroying their entire fleet. The events at Sinop alarmed the other great powers, and the representatives at Vienna quickly finalized a proposed peace treaty, which they presented to Sultan Abdul Majid and Tsar Nicholas in December. 
Nicholas was willing to accept the terms offered, but the Sultan objected, and diplomatic talks soon completely broke down. Fighting continued, and in February of 1854, Britain and France presented an ultimatum to Russia, withdraw from the Balkans or they would join the war. But now, Russia refused to back down, and the British and French declared their own war in March of 1854. Having made no further gains and fearing the intervention of a dubiously neutral Austria, Nicholas ordered his forces to withdraw from the Balkan provinces in July. Russia what they say about Austria? And fearing the intervention of a dubiously neutral Austria, Nicholas ordered his forces to withdraw from the Balkan provinces in July. Russia at this time was one of Austria's most important allies, and so by not supporting the Russians, they found themselves isolated diplomatically all throughout the 19th century. With hostilities temporarily ceased, the war could have ended there. But Britain and France, spurred on by pro-war public opinion and eager to put an end to further Russian expansion, chose to continue the fighting, launching a full invasion of the Crimean Peninsula. I was too distracted with the animation. With hostilities temporarily ceased, the war could have ended there. But Britain and France, spurred on by pro-war public opinion and eager to put an end to further Russian expansion, chose to continue the fighting, launching a full invasion of the Crimean Peninsula. Seizing this peninsula would cripple Russia's naval power in the Black Sea, greatly reducing their influence in the Middle East and Balkans. The Allied forces landed at a beach north of the city of Sevastopol in September, and their troubles began almost immediately. The landing of the invasion force was bad. Oh, sorry, I want to take a piss. Be right back. Okay, sorry. The landing of the invasion force was badly mismanaged. For starters, there was no equipment for the unloading of cargo, forcing the soldiers to steal carts and wagons from nearby Tartar. This is the British and French, Indian. right? Yeah. Badly mismanaged. For starters, there was no equipment for the unloading of cargo, forcing the soldiers to steal carts and wagons from nearby Tartar farms. During this piecemeal unloading process, the soldiers were forced to sleep outside in the rain and heat due to the lack of tents and camping supplies. To make matters even worse, there was not enough food or water to go around, nor enough medicine to treat the many men who came down with cholera and other diseases. After four days, the invasion force finally overcame this comedy of errors and set out for Sevastopol. On the first day of their march, the Allied forces got their first glimpse of the Russian army assembled on a hill on the other side of the Alma River. The next morning, they so glad I found another channel with with nice maps. Crossed the river and attacked the Russians, beginning the Battle of Alma. The defenders were outnumbered, with 37,500 men standing against the 56,500 strong invasion force. But the Russians held a strong defensive position on a steep hill. They held out against three hours of repeated assaults by the Ottomans, British, and French before withdrawing. However, the Allied forces were unable able to pursue them due to their lack of cavalry. Following the battle, the invading army marched southeast to the coast, encircling Sevastopol and establishing temporary ports at the towns of Balaclava and Kamish to bring in supplies. In October, they began to besiege the city with cannon brought in by sea. Although further widespread outbreaks of cholera weakened the British army, emboldening the defenders to launch several probing attacks. On October 25th, the Russians attempted a large-scale assault on the British position at Balaclava, sending 25,000 men to disrupt the Allies' supply chain between their ports and the siege lines. The first line of defenses at the Vorontsov Heights, manned by the Ottomans, was quickly overwhelmed. And the Russian cavalry then swept down the hill toward the second defensive line in the valley to the south. 
There, a combined force of Ottoman and British infantry managed to hold the line against the enemy cavalry charge in a defense that would come to be known as the Thin Red Line. On the northern side of the hill, the British cavalry's light brigade was sent to intercept Russian forces, attempting to withdraw after seizing Ottoman artillery guns captured on the heights. But this order, relayed verbally through multiple sources in something like a game of telephone, was ultimately misinterpreted by the light brigade's commanders who sent the light cavalry charging down the valley. To be honest, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often with the uh, lack of communication technology through multiple sources in something like a game of telephone was ultimately misinterpreted by the light brigade's commanders who sent the light cavalry charging down the valley straight into the teeth of a dug-in Russian artillery regiment. The resulting charge of the light brigade was a complete failure and left over a third of the brigade's soldiers killed, wounded, or captured, and over a half of its horses dead. Shortly thereafter, the Russian forces pulled back to their newly captured defensive positions at the Vorontsov Heights, and the battle came to an end. While the siege of Sevastopol would continue, the Russians had won a tactical and morale-boosting victory at Balaclava, in large part thanks to the disorganization of their enemies. This disorganization and incompetence at the command level would continue to plague the Allied forces for the rest of the war, preventing them from gaining significant ground. To watch the rest of this bloody stalemate play out, head over to the part two of this video available right now through the link in the description below. I will, but I am going to separate this into two separate videos, all right? Easier for me to learn that way, all right? So I'll be back with the other one very soon, guys. See you next time.